bless you, everybody. If you have your Bibles, let's come over to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. What a beautiful Sunday morning. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. And uh, while you're making your way there, a couple of things really quickly. Hope to see you this Wednesday for Family Life Night. The adults will be here in the sanctuary for the last night in our summer pulpit series with uh, our good friend, Pastor Bill Gestel from Presbyterian Church of Old Greenwich. Pastor Bill brought us a great word last year on the armor of God, and uh, you'll really be blessed by that. The kids have uh, worship through the arts downstairs, and uh, all of our teens are planning a great night outside as well. And then as we go deeper into the month of August. There will not be uh, children's ministries for several weeks on August Wednesdays. And uh, TCSM for our junior and senior high students will continue to meet. And the adults will be having uh, some prayer meetings downstairs. And uh, the TCSM, the teens will be returning to the sanctuary in a couple of weeks on Wednesdays. Uh, something new that we just scheduled uh, due to popular demand and kind of so new that I don't think it's hit your bulletin yet, but we have scheduled another water baptism service. Uh, just just a few weeks from now, we had so many people inquiring about water baptism. Yeah, praise the Lord. So uh, that service is going... That service is going to take place in three weeks, uh, Sunday the 23rd in Norwalk, Connecticut. And uh, if you'd like to be baptized, please give us a call at the church office. There will also be a water baptism class uh, on that morning, the morning of the 23rd, for anybody who would like to be baptized in water. If you've never been baptized in water, we really strongly encourage you to take that step of obedience. Follow Jesus into the waters of baptism. It's a great and a powerful moment, a great and powerful transaction in the life of every believer. Okay, 2 Corinthians 5, and I'm going to begin reading this morning at verse 1. Paul says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. If indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust are well known in your consciences. And I want to share with you this morning on this topic, walking by faith, not by sight. Walking by faith, not by sight. Let's pray together and invite the Holy Spirit to come and minister to us out of the Word of God this morning. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you in the beautiful name of Jesus this morning. It's the name that opens heaven's door to us. Jesus, you said that the word of God is like seed. And so we pray that our hearts might be good soil during these next few minutes. Soil that can receive and hold on to and bear fruit from the word of God. Jesus, you said that the words you speak to us are spirit and life. So we ask you to send your spirit now. Minister that life to us from your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, last week we were very blessed to have Pastor Charles with us from Stanford, and he brought us a great word about growing into the fullness of Christ. Please make sure you get a copy of that if you missed it. Over the last few weeks before that, we've been working our way through Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, and Pastor Glenn had shared from chapter 4 on why we suffer affliction. Then a couple of weeks ago, I spoke from the latter part of chapter 5 about our call to be ambassadors for Christ. 
Today we're circling back to the beginning of this powerful chapter and we're looking at how God has called us to walk by faith. We said before that within chapter 5, Paul is encouraging the church to stay on track with him in his apostolic mission. His hope was that the Corinthians would not be distracted by things which will one day seem very insignificant to us when we leave this earth. A segment of the church, we've said, was opposed to Paul's ministry. And throughout 2 Corinthians, we will find that Paul is defending himself here and there. I think that Paul was probably better at defending himself with humility and gentleness than we often can be. But one way that Paul defends his reputation here is by reminding the church of who he is. That he is a person whose life has been completely joined, completely united to Christ. Paul's purpose in life is to pursue eternal things, things that matter. In other words, the church needed to remember that only someone who was truly motivated, who was motivated by the love of God, would be living the way that Paul lived among them. Paul was the genuine article. He was a real Christian and a true apostle who was walking by faith. His mission was to please God and his mission was to partner with God for the eternal purposes of God in Jesus Christ. How many of you know that as believers in Christ, we should be known for our focus on Christ and a single-minded pursuit of the kingdom of God? Jesus said, seek ye second, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen. We are called to rise above the type of environment that Paul saw in Corinth in which we cut other people down so that we could advance ourselves. We're called to avoid getting bogged down in the cares of this life too much. Jesus said that those kinds of things were thorns in our lives. Thorns that could choke out the seed of the word of God. Instead, we need to pursue a life that makes an eternal difference. A life of impact. You know, I'm sure you've seen a lot of cute videos about things like this, but people often ask kids, what do you want to be when you grow up? And kids always want to be something exciting and something meaningful, don't they? Uh, you may not like their choices, uh, but their choices are never boring. They always want to be a pilot or an astronaut or a fireman or a rock star or something dramatic, right? You wouldn't be too happy if your kid came to you one day and said, Mom, Dad, I want to be a couch potato. I want you to support me my whole life, and I want to develop carpal tunnel from playing PS4 all day. <laughs> now, we instinctively know that there's something wrong with that. We instinctively know that that is substandard living, and it's certainly substandard Christian living. Amen. We were made for a life of impact. But how can we know, how can we tell if we, like Paul, are the genuine article? To be blunt about it, how can I tell if I'm really living the Christian life? As it was with Paul, so it will be with a man who has really laid hold of God with us. It will be the same way with us. If you've been laid a hold of by God, you will also lay a hold of the things that matter to God. Amen. Paul said in Philippians 3, I press on so that I may lay hold of the thing for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. A life of walking by sight is limited by what I can see, by what I can feel. It will never accomplish much for God. It will never be connected to the eternal purposes of God. And so it will never have a lasting impact. But a life of walking by faith can change you and it can change your family. It can change your region. It can change your world. When you walk by faith, the Holy Spirit will connect your heart to eternal priorities, to the things that are the priorities of the Father's heart. A life of walking by faith brings pleasure to the Father's heart. The Bible says, you know, that without faith it is impossible to please God. How many of you want to walk by faith and bring pleasure to the Father's heart in this house? I find here in 2 Corinthians 5 three ways that we walk by faith and I want to share them with you today. How to walk by faith and the first way is this, live in expectancy of the resurrection. Live 
in expectancy of the resurrection. Paul says in verse 1, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. We walk by faith and not by sight when we live expecting the resurrection of life. And this kind of faith brings pleasure to God. Paul was a tent maker and he compares our bodies to tents in order to make the point that they are only temporary. Some tents are sturdier than others to be sure, but no tent lasts forever. You know, even the mighty Harvest Time Air Dome was starting to show its age when we had to take it down. But in the early church, the first Christians, when they spoke about leaving this life, they called it putting off their tent. Peter said, shortly I must take off, I must put off my tent as the Lord Jesus has shown me. The apostles compared this frail body to a tent because they wanted us to keep in mind that the real you, the inner man, is waiting to be clothed with something more permanent. Amen. As Christians, we have the hope of resurrection life. Christ will one day transform our weak bodies into glorious bodies like his own. What a great day that will be. Amen? That new body is the permanent building that Paul is talking about, which one day we will receive in exchange for these fragile tents that we're living in. Paul says we know that we have a building from God. Because God is preparing us an eternal body, we can walk by faith and not by sight. We don't live like other people live. We don't have to fear what other people fear. The pagan world said, and pagans today still say the same thing, let us eat, drink, and be merry, because tomorrow we die. In other words, make sure that you party as much as you can today, because pretty soon it's going to be over, and that'll be the end of you. What a hopeless way to live. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's depressing. <laughs> Well, it is depressing. But the Christian walks by his faith. He knows that he's going somewhere. Maybe we should write a book about this. Instead of calling it your best life now, we can call it your best life later. You see, whether I think my best life is now or later makes a difference in how I live. Because I know that I have a building that God is preparing for me, something glorious and permanent, I can choose to let go of what unbelievers are chasing, of what they're trying to hang on to so desperately. Amen. We know that Christ will raise us up with him. And because of that, we can live by faith. We can give away our lives like a seed. We can do what Jesus said. We can lose our lives for the sake of Christ so that we can truly gain our real life. Amen. Paul says we groan because we desire to be clothed. In the Greek, that word groaning means we are sighing. When we see our bodies and sometimes our minds start to decline a little bit, we begin to sigh, don't we? We feel some pains in places in our body we didn't even know existed. Once upon a time, you ran up the stairs two at a time. Now that staircase is starting to look like Kilimanjaro. <laughs> And after you slowly climb that mountain and get to the top, guess what? You don't remember why you went up there. I think some of you know what I'm talking about. And everybody under 30 said, that'll never happen to me. But God has given us a promise that one day he's going to replace our old tent with a beautiful new palace to house our spirits. Amen. But Paul says we don't want to be unclothed, but we want to be further clothed. We don't just want to go to sleep 
ancient pagan people believed, and modern pagans still do believe, that our consciousness is just extinguished or something when we die, or that we just become disembodied spirits floating around. But we know that there's something greater coming for us, and knowing this empowers me to live with confidence. Paul says we won't be unclothed, we'll be further clothed in a way that is greater than we can possibly imagine today. You will not be like Casper, the friendly ghost. We will have real bodies that are capable of fully enjoying everything that God has made. It will be the end of calories. <laughs> You will be ageless and tireless. You'll be incapable of knowing any more sickness or pain or death. The Bible says we're only groaning for a time, waiting for the redemption of our bodies. The final stage of the salvation that Jesus has purchased for us will be that we share in our bodies, that we share in the glory of his resurrection. Paul says here a beautiful thing that mortality will be swallowed up by life. People who walk by sight and not by faith live in fear of death. Why? Because they look at this world with their natural eyes and in this world we know that death eventually swallows everything. But Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die, Jesus said. Do you believe this? And Paul says in verse 5, God has prepared us for this very thing. We may be groaning in this tent today, but believers know that this old tent is only phase one of what God has prepared for them. Harvest Time Church has a phase two out there, and so do you. God is the architect of your phase two, and it's better, and it's eternal. This was God's intention for us. That's part of why he called you. God has prepared you for this very thing. What we have in Christ is good already, but what's coming is far, far better. The word of God says, eye is not seen, ear is not heard, neither has it entered at any time into the heart of man the things that God has prepared for those who love him. And God has prepared us for those things. We walk by faith and not by sight when we live for what is eternal, when we live in expectation of the resurrection. How to walk by faith and not by sight. The first way is to live expecting the resurrection. The second way is this, live in expectancy of good results. Live expecting good results. Results. Paul says in verse 11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. But we are well known to God, and I also trust we are well known in your consciences. We walk by faith and not by sight when we expect that God will give us fruit from our labors in this life. That God will give us good results when we work for him. And this kind of faith also brings pleasure to God. Paul was speaking here of how he refused to, sh to stop sharing Christ with other people, regardless of how they treated him or regardless of whether they received him. And he was also subtly trying to convince the church of his integrity in ministry. How many of you know that discouragement is one of the greatest weapons in the enemy's arsenal? How many of you have faced discouragement once or twice along the way? Paul faced it, as we all do. At the beginning of this letter, Paul shared with the Corinthians the pressures he had been facing. He said, we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, so that we should not trust in ourselves, but trust in God who raises the dead. Paul would not give up. He trusted in God, and God gave him fresh strength from the Holy Spirit. In the power of that strength, Paul kept working. He continued to walk by faith. He continued to believe that his mission must go on and must bear fruit. Pastor Glenn shared with us several weeks ago that Paul kept on believing that all of God's promises to him would be yes and would be amen in Christ Jesus. 
What kind of father is our God? The Bible says there has not failed one word of all his good promise. Amen. Church, I want to tell you, listen to this. Many Christians quit today. Not because they think God doesn't care about them, but because they're not seeing God bless their efforts. I'm going to say that again. Many Christians are quitting today not because they think God doesn't care, but because they are not seeing God bless their labors for Him. As a friend of mine says, that's good preaching right here. Some Christians no longer have faith to see a good harvest for their labors. But church, God promises us that God will cause a harvest to come forth from everything that you've done for Him and that you continue to do for Him. Don't stop sowing. Don't stop praying. Don't stop working for Jesus. Believe him for the results. And don't be discouraged by what the Bible calls the day of small beginnings. Let the love of God keep pushing you as the love of God kept pushing Paul to reach out to people. Paul said, knowing the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. He was saying, unsaved men have abused me. They've thrown me in jail and done all kinds of miserable things to me, but I will continue to reach out to them because God has given me his love for them. And because I love them, I will continue to warn them of the judgment that's to come. Knowing the terror of the Lord, I persuade men. And this is how it is with us. We need to know, we need to remember, we can't save them. But we need to trust God that as we share the message of life with people that don't know God, some of them will indeed respond and be saved. Aren't you glad somebody reached out to you? How many of you were, how many of you were unlikely candidates for the word of grace? I'll continue to walk by faith by continuing to reach out in faith and trusting God for the outcome of my labors. I am still expecting results. Then Paul says, I am well known to God. Now this is a little swipe, a little gentle swipe at the Corinthians. In other words, Paul was saying, it's okay that not all of you receive me as an apostle. It's okay that some of you have wounded me. I can't make you receive me as you should receive me, but God knows the sincerity of my heart, and so I'm leaving the outcome to God. He says, I also trust that we are well known in your consciences. In other words, Paul was saying, I am trusting that in your heart, you know what kind of person I really am. And you know how I've loved you as a father. So I will leave the outcome to God and instead I will trust God to take care of my reputation among you. How many of you know it takes some faith to trust God to take care of your reputation sometimes? Church, let me speak a word of peace to somebody who needs to hear it today. Walking by faith means that we trust God for the outcome of our labor. And we trust God for the outcomes of strained relationships in the Lord. I'm not saying that God will always miraculously fix all of our mistakes when we haven't treated people in a Christ-like way. Sometimes there is work that we need to do. To make things right with people. Amen. But you know many Christians I find. And we hear it as pastors. Many Christians get discouraged. When they find that even when they've done the right thing. Sometimes they still cannot resolve their differences. With a brother or a sister. This is a hard thing in the Christian life. And it demands that we walk by faith in that situation. Paul could say I trust that I'm well known to your conscience. He had to believe that God would cause the Corinthians to hear his heart, that God would help them to have the right opinion of him and receive him in the love of Christ. You know, as we sometimes struggle in relationships within the body, it may comfort you to know that the apostles uh, were not immune to these things. The Bible records for us, kind of embarrassingly I think, that Paul and Barnabas, two apostles, had such a spectacular argument that they stopped working together permanently. You know, there, you know, chapter 14 doesn't say, Barnabas returneth back and saith, my bad. <laughs> That's not in there. The fact of the matter is that we simply do not know how it turned out 
between those two brothers and we never see them working together again. Paul said in Romans 12, if it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Walking by faith means that we do our best to live peaceably with all men, but then we have to trust God to heal our relationships. We have to, by faith, put that fractured thing in his hands and leave it there. Walking in faith based on the promise God gives us that God will cause all things. Everybody say all things. God will cause all things to work together for your good if you love him and if you're one of his called ones according to his purpose. Just like Paul did. Let's continue to walk by faith. Continuing to work and continuing to believe God for good fruit from the things we do for Jesus. Let's continue to believe that all of God's promises are yes and amen in him. We walk by faith and not by sight when we choose not to be discouraged by what we've been seeing. But instead we trust God for fruitful labor and for wholeness in our relationships. How to walk by faith and not by sight. The first way is to live in expectancy of the resurrection. The second way is to live expecting results. And finally, the third way to walk by faith is this. Live in expectancy of your reward. Live expecting your reward. Beginning in verse 8, we read, Paul says, We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well pleasing to him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. That each one may receive the things done in the body according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We walk by faith and not by sight when we live expecting to be rewarded by Jesus for what we've done for the Lord. I walk by faith and not by sight when how I speak and how I behave is a dead giveaway. When my life reveals truly who I am to people, when it shows that I understand that there will be a reward for godly living, and that kind of faith also brings pleasure to God. You know, in this area of godly living, walking by sight can infect our spirits. We are tempted to walk by sight when we realize that God has not yet made everything right with this world. Amen. We become offended sometimes, even offended at God, when we come to feel that the wicked are winning. That the wicked are being rewarded and you are not. Will there be a day of reckoning in which God will reward his servants for their works and make straight everything that's crooked in this world? The answer is absolutely yes. Praise God. The Bible says God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love which you've shown toward his name in that you have ministered to the saints and you do continue to minister. Church, you can rejoice today because Jesus said, Behold, I am coming quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according as his work shall be. You know, in the modern world, People are very quick to say, how dare you judge me? Only God can judge me. <laughs> and yet we know that people who talk like that don't really wish to be judged by God either, do they? You see, for a world that's in rebellion against Jesus Christ, anticipating the judgment of God is a fearful thing. But the Christian woman, the Christian man, knows that his judge has also become his savior. And in that spirit of faith, Paul says, I'm not afraid to see him. I am confident and I am even well pleased to leave this tent and to go to be with Jesus. We will all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. The Bible calls it in Greek, it's the Bema seat. And in Greek culture, this is the kind of throne, and I'm sure you've seen pictures of this, but this is the kind of throne that is elevated, that a king would mount up to by a, a small set of stairs. In church, 
I'm here to tell you on the authority of God's word that your destiny as a faithful saint is to appear before Jesus Christ on his throne and see him looking down upon you with love from that Bema seat, placing a crown of victory upon your brow and saying, well done, you good and faithful servant. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, this judgment seat is not a terror. It is not to determine whether you are saved. It is only designed to demonstrate the rewards that God will give to his faithful ones who already are saved. And there, our works will be tested. Will we bring him works of gold and silver and precious stones? Will there also be some wood, hay, and stubble in there to be consumed. God will test our works on that day. And unlike the courts of men, we know that God can also examine our motives. So in that day, we will know not the outward appearance of a man, but we will know people for what they really were. God will give his saints specific positions in his kingdom. Jesus spoke about a man ruling five cities and another man ruling over ten cities. God will assign to you and to me places of authority in his kingdom with perfect fairness. I always like to say it this way. You may be here this morning and without realizing it, you are sitting next to the future king of the Bronx. <laughs> But if we labor faithfully for Jesus, there will be special crowns awaiting us. You can read about several of them in the scriptures. Paul says, for example, in 2 Timothy 4, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. And therefore there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all those who have longed for his appearing. Praise God. Church, think about this, friends, before before you throw in the towel this morning. Your earthly victories, if you hang in there, will determine your heavenly rank and sphere of authority. Paul says, I am making it, therefore, my aim to be pleasing to him. Because I love him. Because I want to please him. Because I know he's keeping a good set of books on me. I can walk by faith even in the middle of injustice. I'll keep on working for him even when the world, even when my relatives tell me that I am wasting my life by living for Jesus. I know by faith that I will be rewarded by the Son of God. And therefore I do not give up. Amen. Worship team, you can come back and help us, please. Church, walking by sight is very easy. Walking by sight is so easy that anybody can do it. And in fact, most people are very good at it. When I walk by sight, I'm living for the here and now. Because I'm walking without an expectation of the resurrection that pulls me forward in hope. I live for myself, and I have no desire to sow myself, to sow my life as a seed for Jesus and for others. When I walk by sight, I can become weary and discouraged because I'm not trusting God anymore to produce a good harvest from my labors. I give up because I'm not trusting in his providence. He's the God that two birds can't fall to the ground without him knowing it. And when I walk by sight, I don't trust the way that God is using me. Did you hear that this morning? When I walk by sight, I'm not trusting the way that God is using me. How many times have we all forgotten that he many times brings fruit out of our lives in ways that we were not expecting? When I walk by sight, I become offended at God because I'm no longer trusting in his righteous judgment and I'm no longer trusting in his promised righteous rewards. When I walk by sight, I cease to believe that God is a faithful wage payer. I cease to believe that soon and very soon God is going to enter history again one final time to establish his kingdom of perfect righteousness. When I walk by sight, I become offended as I see evil men prospering in this world. And I become offended and grieved when I see the righteous being slain by the hands of wicked men. 
Church, today, the Holy Spirit is calling you and me to be confident once again. He is calling you to remember that you are going to be rewarded. We've become the people of the Spirit. And yet God wants us to know that all that we know, all that we've received of the Holy Spirit up until now is only a down payment. It is only what the Bible would refer to as a deposit or an engagement ring from Christ to His church. In this world, the Bible says we have only tasted of the powers, the good powers of the age to come. The Holy Spirit within you is the guarantee that there will be a reward for walking by faith. The presence of the Spirit within you is a guarantee from God that you will experience the fullness of the resurrection glory of Jesus. Because of the Holy Spirit within us, we can feel it already. We can feel the pull of heaven. We can feel God's presence drawing us to our true home now, even if we are not able here to see those gates of pearl. The Spirit of the Lord wants to make you brave to walk by faith, living for God with boldness because we have the hope of the resurrection. The Holy Spirit gives us strength to walk by faith and keep on working when people tell you, when the enemy's voice says to you, you're not accomplishing anything. We keep on working because we keep on trusting in God for the results of our labors. And the Spirit of God inspires us to walk by faith so that like Paul, we make it our goal to please Him, waiting for His return and waiting for His reward, not with fear, but with confidence and with joy in our spirits. Church, as we close this morning, hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great hope of reward. For you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise for yet a little while. And he who is coming will come and will not tarry. Now the just shall live by faith. And church, because of his great word of promise, we can walk by faith and not by sight. Come on, stand together and let's praise Jesus together. Hallelujah.